I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedules today to join us to discuss this important topic. I'm honored to be with you all today to advocate on behalf of the countless service members and veterans who live with PTSD, depression, anxiety, and other mental health conditions, and also their family members who support them and stand beside them every day. We have all heard the 20 or 22 per day statistic, and while we all know this is a tragedy, it's easy to get lost in the number. I do every day, working at the national level on this issue. But as someone who has been impacted personally by suicide, I can personally tell you one is one too many. We're also here today to push past the statistic and present you with real policy solutions that will allow America to begin to turn the corner on this horrifying problem, provide our vets and service members with the correct and expedient diagnoses, and then deliver the best mental health care possible. I'm honored and Nami is thrilled to be joined by Command Sergeant Major Tom Satterley and his wonderful wife, Jen. I had the opportunity to spend the day yesterday on the Hill um, with, with Tom and Jen and um, had some amazing meetings. And I can tell you that when you hear his story, I think you will be just as, um, just as inspired um, as, as I am to come here every day and try to make a difference on behalf of our veterans. Um, so Command Sergeant Major Satterley, a little bit about him. He served 25 years in the Army, the last 20 years in Delta Force. And while he's been a part of all, a lot of cool missions and a lot of amazing things, many of which he can't tell us about um, because it's still classified. Um, I'm thrilled though that someone of his caliber and stature is coming to Capitol Hill to join NAMI to talk about his struggle with PTSD and mental health conditions. So we're going to hear from both uh, him and his wife on the spouse perspective um, and how this affects families. And then I'm going to be joined by my colleague in our Montana State Organization, uh, Matt Coons, who's the Executive Director of NAMI Montana who's worked on veteran suicide issues for over a decade uh, to present some of the latest research and the policy solutions that NAMI is proposing um, to move us path, through this path forward. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Command Sergeant Major Satterley up. Thank you, Emily, and good morning, everybody. Please excuse me for having notes, but as you know, with PTSD and TBI, your memory seems to lack a little bit, and I don't want to forget any important points. So again, my name is Tom Satterley, and I'm here with my lovely wife, Jen. We want to thank you for taking the time to hear our words today. It's an honor to be invited to address you on behalf of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and to share the unique challenges veterans face in their reintegration into civilian life. This after sustaining mental, physical, and emotional trauma that is often misdiagnosed and untreated. I can tell you from personal experience that it is true. There are wounds that never show in the body, that are deeper and hurt more than anything that bleeds. I was born and raised in a small town in Indiana, and I was brought up in what you would call a normal middle class American family. I ran the cornfields with my friends, played sports, and of course I got grounded from time to time. My first eight years of education were at St. Peter's Lutheran Church, and we were pretty much in church every Wednesday and Sunday. And back in the day, that was considered a normal American boy. When we were little, my brother and I used to wake my older sister up on Saturday mornings by playing with our little green army men. Our battlefield was the mountain she created by huddling under her covers. She didn't really appreciate this, but we didn't really ask her because she was sleeping at the time. We learned early the consequences of rebelling against command when she ordered us to make her cinnamon sugar toast one morning after battle. And we sprinkled it liberally with uh, Tabasco sauce. So. After the first bite, she chased us through the house of my dad's guitar, so needless to say, we did not repeat that offense. It is important to follow orders. I joined the Army to serve my country, learn important skills, and see the world that I heard so much about from my friends. I wanted to be a leader, a game changer, a protector of this life that I knew and appreciated. I did all of those things, and through it all, I had no conception of the cost nor did I allow myself to let it weigh against what was required of me. None of us do when we are serving what we know to be a greater cause. We all volunteered to serve the Army, and I hold a great reverence for it and pride in knowing that I gave my very best in those 25 years, 20 of those in Delta Force. Please hear me when I say to you that we are not done. We want more than to come home. We want to heal. 
We want to rebuild our lives, our relationships, and offer the leadership we've shouldered over the years to the homes and communities we live in now. I have a deep love and gratitude for the opportunity I was given to serve this country, provide for myself and my family. I value beyond words the friends who became family, and were at times the split-second decision between life and death for me. Those, those split seconds allowed me to be standing here in front of you today with an unyielding hope and vision for all of us that makes every one of those seconds matter. I'm not the same man I was before my friends fell around me, lost the viciousness of combat. And for years, that was not a good thing. My sense of guilt, sorrow, and rage were still breathing while my friends didn't. It made me someone for a while that you're lucky not to have known. You may wonder, depending on your personal experiences, why there's such difficulty in walking away from what was and making a new life with what is. Why is it not a simple thing to retire from service and pick up the threads we left behind? All I can do is tell you my story. My first experience of combat was in Somalia in 1993, and I had been a Delta roughly two years at the time. We had had about five missions prior to through October in Somalia at the time. Nothing too scary, a few shots fired, but nothing could prepare us for what was about to come. What began as a one-hour mission became the longest sustained firefight since Vietnam. For 18 hours, we struggled to survive rapidly evolving conditions. We ran out of water, ammunition, medical supplies, and did not expect a desperately needed night vision to be left behind during daylight hours. This mission changed the way Delta and the rest of the armed forces conducted missions from that time forward. With the report of the first Black Hawk down, we began moving to the target building, to the crash site, with what felt like the entire city shooting at us. We were racing at dangerous speeds to get there before the Somalians, to keep any survivors from being captured or killed. We were highly trained, we were the best in the world, and we thought we were invincible. Then a friend across the street took a bullet to the head. He never moved again. Never get to say goodbye or thank you. The next morning when the armored vehicles finally arrived, they were so full of dead and wounded, there was no room to get inside. We knew we'd have to run under heavy fire, unprotected, with nothing to stop us from the next ones to fall. We were again running out of ammunition. So we began running the Mogadishu Mile, and we were extremely dehydrated and suffering from sleep deprivation. These are the times when the things that drive us during the heart of combat begin to flicker. It's not supposed to be like this. We're battling the entire city to get to a crash site, We're battling the entire night to stay alive, and then a friend of yours takes a bullet to the face, and another is hit with an RPG. His body parts and his blood are all over you and in your eyes and mouth. And these are men that you ate with, laughed with, and loved like brothers. You don't get to stop or go home at that moment, or you don't even get to greet because they're coming for you next. This is a small example of the combat that changed me forever. It didn't take Iraq or Afghanistan or the many other places I've been since then. It took only that one. And that all probably took place in 15 minute time period out of that entire night. Combat does something to the human spirit that cannot be explained to anyone who has not experienced it firsthand, and it affects every person differently. I continued my career in Delta conducting missions around the world and ended up in Iraq. While luck remained with me, near IED misses, and the years of repetitive physical and mental injuries to my body had taken its toll. I have since that time had multiple neck and back surgeries and a shoulder surgery, and my neck and lower back refused. I became someone I didn't like or respect. Years of daily pain from medical procedures and other injuries caused a constant inner fight against depression and anger. But all that paled in comparison to my emotional pain. I've used alcohol in a desperate attempt to numb any or all of them, even if just for a little while. That did nothing to feed the issues I already struggled with. No one talked about my performance slipping, but I knew. I hated myself for it, and I handled it by blaming everyone around me. 
I blame them for a job that I volunteered to do. I blame them for a job that I can continue to do for the rest of my life, and I feel back in a second if asked. For 10 years, I saw military psychiatrists, therapists, and doctors who offered blanket treatments. Pills that were supposed to be temporary became the treatment. They grew to even more pills. They tried to silence the symptoms without treating their cause, and there's no healing in that. When I went for my VA rating physical, they wouldn't diagnose me at the time with PTSD because I had already stated I was willing to go back. Four simple questions. I didn't want to go back, but I would. I trained my entire life to do this one thing with excellence. And if that meant I couldn't be diagnosed or treated for PTSD, then so be it. <clears throat> Shortly after my retirement from the Army, my untreated PTSD led me to sitting in a parking garage in a car four years ago. I had a gun in my lap. My only thought was, do I put it in my mouth or to the side of my head? I wanted to make sure I did this job correctly as well. At that pivotal moment, I received a text from a lady who had been filming our training that day. And apparently I was almost late to a meeting I was supposed to have in a hotel lobby bar. So being the person I was, I didn't want to be late, so I slid my gun under the seat and met them in the hotel lobby and decided not to tell anybody what I was doing. That was the first time she saved my life. Excuse me. Eventually we began dating, and while sitting with her in a sidewalk cafe, she began asking me questions about my experiences in Somalia. I had not talked about that day in 20 years, but for two hours, I sat and cried while she listened. She told me it was okay to cry, it's okay to talk, and that both were needed to heal old wounds. I thought she was crazy. I wondered what was wrong with me, how I'd broken down, and how I could fix it. I married her two and a half years ago anyway. It was the second time she saved my life. Marriage to me has been no walk in the park for her, and sometimes it's been hell. But she's a force of nature and refused to break under the pressure of my paranoia, depression, alcohol abuse, insomnia, and severe anger issues. She began studying PTSD, treatment options, and how she could best support me. She researched doctors for my specific issues so I could begin the road to recovery. Unfortunately, finding doctors that take TRICARE in our area proved to be difficult at best. <clears throat> I finally found out just this year why I'm still having issues. Jen explained to me that my parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems never shut down. My cortisol levels are always high. Years of high stress and night missions make it nearly impossible to reach a state of calmness and get any sleep. Adjusting to regular life after 25 years of combat readiness has felt like an impossible achievement. I still switch lanes away from parked vehicles and other debris on the roads. I can't eat in a restaurant with my back facing the door and I have to make eye contact with everybody in the room before I can sit down. Just last year, I broke out in a cold sweat at Disney when I saw a backpack left unattended in the crowd. Sounds crazy, I know, but it's a lifetime of training. What you call odd is survival to me. I have three failed marriages instead of four because Jen is a force of nature, and that nature is overflowing with a compassion and love I've never known before. I have a damaged relationship with my son. I'm desperately working to repair it. He recently joined the Army and is currently in AIT at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And trust me, I tried to get him to go to college. I believe the inability to reconnect when we come home stems from most of us being raised a certain way throughout our childhood. We then find ourselves facing circumstances so horrifying to who we are that we have to shut down emotionally in order to survive. We have to do this if we want to make it back home. When we return home, it's difficult if not impossible for us to know how to integrate into the normal life we knew before experience shattered us. We don't know yet how to find the lessons and the tragedies we were part of. We're too busy reacting with great speed and instinct to threats that are no longer there. We were trained to be superhuman, to be able to bear unbearable things and to do and see things I hope with all my heart none of you ever have to do or see. We were sent to guard the walls, and we did what we were called to do. 
We went beyond the walls. We went into the living rooms and bedrooms of the terrorists that would come after us. We had to take it to them. And we survived, mostly. But we don't recognize home anymore. We don't recognize the family and friends we left behind. And we certainly don't recognize ourselves. It takes more courage to find our way back to this world at home than it ever took to shut ourselves down, to face the one we were lost, where we lost so many, where we became more machine than man. I'm learning that the way back home for every word is to speak the truth, speak the pain, give it light and air, and let it heal at its own speed. Take some of the skills and wisdom gained from what scars the soul to reach out and help those who still don't see they deserve it, still don't know they're worth saving. Don't yet realize that they have to have the courage to step up. They have to step up and save themselves, help others find their way home as well. We did it in our service and we need to do it now. This is my mission. We still have much to offer this country, our communities, and our families. It takes courage to open up and come clean and to stand up one more time and share the truth with others. This is what I'm doing in front of you today. At one point I was approached by a magazine to do my story. Not the war stories that people usually want to hear, but my personal story and what happens after. I didn't want to do it. Not at first, that's for sure, because I am not the kind of person that is willing to admit defeat or weakness of any kind. In 21 years, I'd only talked to Jen about what I held inside, and now this magazine wanted to tell the world. I didn't want to be ridiculed for the things I struggled with. I had a lot of shame about what I was going through and who I'd become. Thankfully, Jen taught me into letting me write my story, and what happened next was completely unexpected. I started receiving messages on social media from everybody around the world, from people around the world, telling me that they felt the same way. They suffered from the same issues and had the same troubles finding help. I began to get phone calls from other combat veterans because they felt if someone in my rank serving in Delta Force could admit to the severity of my struggle, that it must be okay to admit there's a problem. I've been told that my wife and I have saved people's lives by listening and having the courage to admit weakness. I noticed that I too began to heal even more by helping others and sharing areas where I needed help. It gave me purpose again, and I was ready to accept my next mission. I began to believe I could return to the time I was before Somalia changed the course of my life, that I could become a stronger, better man. I knew that the most important mission of my life is just beginning. Marcus Aurelius wrote, you have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. No one comes out of combat unchanged. There is no one unaffected by it, no matter what they tell you. We've all heard the statistics. We know that since we sat down together this morning, we've probably already lost another five to seven veterans to suicide already today. This has reached epidemic proportions. We've lost more veterans to suicide then we've lost in Iraq and Afghanistan wars combined. This is the ultimate tragedy. We have tens of thousands of veterans who may not have experienced a physical death yet, but loss of life is experienced through hopelessness, broken families, financial hardship, depression, fear, and substance abuse. The feelings of being damaged goods. When our spouses stay with us out of love and a desperate attempt to help us, the entire family can suffer loss of life when pain and rage make them the targets for spousal or child abuse. They are all walking wounded. And these are only some of the symptoms of PTSD. We're currently in the process of starting a nonprofit called All Secure Foundation with the intention of securing funding for more veterans to seek treatment. Our hope is to offer scholarships to veterans and their families where applicable who are unable to afford treatment they need once, to begin, once again to begin, be the leaders in their homes and lives that they were so successfully in their service to us all. This is what I have the power to change right now. We would not call anyone here to action unless we were ready and willing ourselves to dedicate to this. This is where I'm led to act. I respectfully ask you to consider what is in your power to change. I'm addressing you directly man to man, man to woman, human to human. We are dying.
Some of us by our own hand, some of us by negligence, but some of us simply by the inability to thrive. Our families are dying and should not be considered collateral damage. Our wives suffer. The children who hold our future in their hands look now to see what will matter to you today. Our communities lack the leadership and focus we could offer as healed and whole individuals, able to contribute as we once did in a world far more damaged than this country we love and have given so much for already. I was speaking with a legislator several weekends ago. He told me that my words here wouldn't matter. It would be a waste of time and that Jim's words would not matter to anyone. That money in and of itself was the driving factor in my decisions made here in each heart. I was told that people here would each give me the appearance of respect when I addressed them and then wipe clean from their slate my story after my last word. We don't accept that. I can't accept that. And we won't. I'm telling you directly as I look into your eyes today that we need you, we need you, and you, and all of you. We need your help. And we need it now. We're weary and injured in both heart and mind. We need your support financially, legislatively, and personally to take who we were raised to be, who we were then trained to be, and combine them. To help us learn how to continue to be the leading edge of thought and hope and action in our communities now that we're home. I have friends who died for you, for the privileges you enjoy and the beliefs that you hold sacred. I but for the grace of God or luck would have done the same. We need your help now to learn how to heal our minds, our hearts, and ways of thinking and reacting. We need you to help us repurpose our skills so that we may continue to offer by our examples the hope and growth and prosperity you asked of us all those years ago. The request you made of us and we answered yes. We need you to say yes to us. We need you to have our backs this time. We need you to help us help ourselves. Give us your commitment with the same heart as we give you ours, but we will have to find those that will and elect them. I'm not asking anyone to give their lives for us. I simply ask that you show by your choices here, when you legislate and make bills to help us, how highly you value those who would and have laid down their lives for you. How will you answer us? Will your actions speak for you as our actions have spoken for us? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time, and thank you for hearing my story. Thank you all for being here today. I know your time is very limited and precious. And thank you, Nami, for having us here to share our stories. Um, your work is very important, and we are truly humbled to be here at our nation's capital, sharing our experiences. I come from a long line of military. My father and brother both served in the Air Force. All of my great uncles served in World War I and II. And my uh, great uncle Frank actually lost his life in a submarine at 19 years old at Pearl Harbor. I'm humbled by the dedication, the determination, the courage and strength that our armed forces show each and every day. I am grateful for the many freedoms that I have and my family has because so many have stood up to serve. I got to lift up the curtain of special operations for three years. I worked as the director of film and photography. I would go on these very big RMTs, or realistic military training exercises. So before they would go deploy, they would practice stateside. I would film these exercises, and the command would get them, and they would review them, AARs. There was a lot of really amazing things I got to see and do, riding Blackhawks and follow Green Berets as they're learning the CQB, and it was a really amazing time. It's not as sexy as Hollywood makes it often with 18-hour days back to back to back and finding two or three hours to sleep on a cockroach-ridden floor. Um, but what I did love about it wasn't that I was working with SEALs and Berets, I was working with Mike. Tim, or Bob, or Jim. These are American soldiers who are heroes to me. And one by one, I started getting pulled aside. I kind of became an official therapist. 
because I loved hearing their stories. They would tell me about the deployments, and then they'd start telling me about a girlfriend back home or a spouse. They'd pull out their phone and start showing me pictures of their children. And then I'd start hearing the darker side, things that they didn't want to admit, but I was hearing them. And I wasn't hearing them from one guy or the next. I started to hear them from hundreds of soldiers and sailors and airmen. One story after the next became all too familiar. So I decided to leave my career in film and photography, become a coach, and start helping veterans one-on-one. -on -one. See, I'm not your soldier. I did not sign any contract to fight unknown enemies or witness the loss of love or find a way to bear unbearable things in order to survive. I have not seen combat. I couldn't tell you a thing about what it means. But I do live with the physical, emotional destruction that it leaves in its aftermath. I am not your soldier, but I fight beside one. Not in a far off country or in a dark alley. Not on a battlefield we'll see on CNN, but in my home. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a shrapnel that's lodged deep in the heart and mind of the man I married and many others who have stood up to serve so selflessly. And not by choice, my husband brought this enemy home. It's a vicious opponent. It's a slow bleed of hope. It's a self-cannibalism of the heart. I've heard it called the invisible enemy. It is not, although it can hide behind masks. But when it shows its face, it looks like physical pain, deep sorrow, depression, in misguided rage. It shows in hopeless words and behavior. It shows in irrational reactions to common things, in the loss of composure and words that destroy. It shows in the self-abuse of drugs and alcohol and in suicide. None of these things are invisible unless you choose to close your eyes. PTSD sits with us at breakfast. It goes along on our turns to carpool. It shows itself in the most inconvenient times to deal with it effectively, and it goes to bed with us at night. When I was a child, I was taught a lot about love and commitment from my grandparents. They lived a challenging and very difficult life. My grandfather suffered with schizophrenia at a time that there was no diagnosis. There wasn't even a name for it. He was in and out of mental hospitals his entire adult life. Every home that they had was lost to the stack of hospital bills. But during that time, my grandmother never left him, not even in the most difficult of times. And believe me, there were some difficult times. She was his champion, his protector, his advocate. And she fought this enemy alongside of him, which had no name, which attacked everyone in the family, including their young daughters. The challenges I face with PTSD are actually quite similar. The diagnosis is often not accurate and the methods of diagnosis are not up to standards. When and if we can find treatment that is covered, they are not comprehensive. And when PTSD is in its full force, I am his advocate, his protector, and his champion. I am the negotiator of our well-being, and I am the de-escalator of the crisis. I met Tom after his retirement, and although he's technically a civilian now, he will always be military in his heart. His PTSD symptoms have been around much longer than me being in the picture, probably 25 years ago after Mogadishu. As he shared with you, he was in the longest sustained firefight since Vietnam, personally witnessing the death of his brothers. No words were spoken to him to address this horrific experience when he came home. It was back to work as normal, the first of many such moments locked away to be dealt with at a more convenient time. It's so just another day at work. And another day for him at work was more combat, with more brothers often dying in his arms, crying out for their mothers. There are some things no person should have to see or do. Yet he did them repeatedly, always making it very clear that he volunteered for this, and that he chose his path. He did it with pride and love for this country. He continued to stockpile internal and external injuries 
that he could not afford to address in his time in service. He had to remain functional. Locking these away meant not facing them, and when you don't face your demons, they end up consuming you. The poison festers and the casualties rise on the home front. His first marriage suffered and ended, a fleeting second, and then there was a painful decomposition of a third. It is Tom's greatest sorrow, and something he still deals with daily, that his relationship with his son was yet another casualty. We watch the news and we are horrified by what we see with these innocent victims, these women and children, these battles torn cities and towns and homes. Yet we need to take a closer look at what's happening right here. The women and the children who are the casualties, the elation they feel, and the courage that they have to call upon daily to survive within their own walls. Their desperate attempts to protect, to protect their children, who like in all wars, are completely innocent here. It is no wonder that the suicide rate is climbing in children of combat veterans. I wake up with a love for my husband, just like any other woman. He makes me laugh, he holds my hand everywhere we go, and he's far better at cleaning than I am. He makes me spe feel special and loved, and our good days are so incredibly good. Seeing who he truly is on these days makes the flip switch of PTSD all that more disturbing, strange, and difficult. And it breaks our heart each and every time it shows its face. It's as, it's as if he is no longer there, and he is no longer in control. And I can see it. I can see him fighting that war within while he's raging on the outside. I do feel helpless in this war, but I have no intention of allowing either of us to become its victim. When we met, I began stockpiling my own arsenal of weapons to fight this darkness, which at times completely consumed him. I began researching any and everything I could, from transcendental meditation to natural supplementation, anger management therapy, hypnosis, you name it, I was online searching it. Often late into the night, I started calling doctors and therapists and naturopaths. And what I found was something that I find really shocking and very disappointing. There isn't a whole lot of help out there. And then when we did find it, it wasn't very comprehensive or they didn't take TRICARE. All the training in the world for him to be the best at military and to create this military force that we have that's phenomenal, yet we don't train our men how to come home. Or better yet, how to repurpose their training so that their life after service can be met with their communities and their families in a positive way. Tom once told me that he would die for me, but I don't want Tom to die for me. I want him to live for me. We don't seek protection from a stranger outside of our home. We seek protection from the enemy, hidden in the Trojan horse of our loved ones. The enemy that destroys the implosion and explosion of untreated damage they've sustained. It's extremely difficult for me to explain this dichotomy. To love someone so completely, to be the person fighting alongside of them, yet to receive the brunt of their paranoia and anger. This is heartbreaking and all too often a frequent scenario for spouses of veterans. Each one of you in this room probably knows a veteran. Pick one now and live that life for just one moment. The person you love most in the world is deployed. You don't know when or if they're coming home. You don't know where they are and no news is good news. You lay in bed at night feeling completely alone, afraid, overwhelmed. The list of to-dos has fallen completely on your shoulders. There's a leaky roof, the car engine light is on, and you have three kids going in five different directions. You're the only mother at a room at the father-son donut day because your kid is not going to be the only one in that room alone again. You wear the hat of father and mother the best you can, and you try to make sure your kids don't get a sense of the fear that you feel in your heart every single day he's gone. But you think things are gonna get better when he's home, you can take a shower longer than five minutes. Thank God somebody's here to help with pre-algebra homework, because that is not my strong suit. But unfortunately for many spouses, the challenges compound when the soldier com comes home. Life has been moving forward the last six months. You're set in your routines. But now the house is disrupted again. 
there's new structure and new, new routines. And the little challenges in life become really frustrating because they're either met with extremes, insignificance, or catastrophe. I just lost a brother and you're complaining about the leaky roof. And yes, the details matter and they're necessary, but a cup in the sink is not the end of the world. And the future of civilization does not weigh in the balance of the poor is not vacuumed. The nightmares scare us both. I don't have training to fight this enemy. I have no compass, I have no map. And when I'm ambushed by this disorder, neither of us are prepared for us. And it further fractures the foundation of the life that we keep rebuilding. This is not a military issue. This is not an American issue. This is a humanity issue. The men, the women, and the children who are casualties of combat are all around you in every state, in every town. They go to your schools, your churches. They sit next to you at Froyo on a Sunday afternoon. These might be people that you know or some of you may even love. And most of you are unaware that they are fighting a war within it all. They have learned to hide their wounds because we haven't taught them how to face them, how to treat them or become whole again. We need better testing and diagnosis. We need to look at PTSD as an individual struggle with individual treatment. This is not a one-size-fits-all disorder. This does not just affect our soldiers. The casualties are numerous and they are innocent. There will be no peace until this war is over. Any veteran, spouse, or child should be able to pick up the phone and get immediate help regardless of their coverage. The endless cycle of searching for help, jumping through hoops, strangling on red tape, and the litany of excuses we hear are completely unacceptable. If you were drowning, what would you prefer for me to do? Shall I shout out words of encouragement? Should I write pointless letters requesting better lifeguards? Maybe throw a bunch of flotation rings just out of reach. Or would you rather have me wade in and directly pull you out? Or shall I take my time and weigh the options while you go under one last time? The decisions you make today here will be your answer. Tom Satterley is my husband, and I am only one of thousands of spouses who are fighting to survive the destruction of PTSD. We are up against obstacles that you have the power to remove so that we can survive and thrive and help others. We need more than words in form of letters and help that is just outside of our reach. Give us your hand. You have the power and the authority to make this right. We empowered you to do so. I am not your soldier. I am his, and I am theirs. Thank you for your time.